What's up, my wizards? Dev. SBMTG down there. We do magic stuff on the YouTubes. And today, a deck tech. I haven't done one of those in too long. It's my favorite thing to do. We got Esper Control for you today. I've been promising it. And we can actually go ahead and say this is our first competitive deck tech of the season, sort of officially, because Shadows of Innistrad was spoiled completely and totally this morning. Quick note, I did promise you Solar Flare a while back. For the uninitiated, Solar Flare is an Esper reanimator control thing that sort of dominated standard like a decade ago. And I think that it's there's a totally a case for it. This isn't that, still working on that, and I actually think it's totally pull-offable in this format. But we're going to stick with Esper Control, just baseline, traditional, standard control deck here. And there's a lot of really good cards for it, and a lot of them are brand New. Let's start with the Planeswalkers here, and a brand new card already. Two copies of Soaring Grim Nemesis, and the card is pretty much as good as you'd want it to be, you know? <laughs> We've all just speculated on how good the card is. It turns out that plus one is boss, and removing creatures with the negative is actually much. A lot of people haven't talked about the fact that you just remove things with a negative X and gain life. That's actually, like, pretty dope, and you don't really ultimate him. Hardly ever, but his first two abilities are so, like, they carry the game so well that I wanted to include two copies of them. I had one copy for a while, um, but two copies is where you want to be. It turns out six mana is not that much of a, of a, you know, barrier to playing the guy. People have said that plus one can win games all by itself. Totally can. Turns out that plus one is maybe the best ability on the Planeswalker, but I do like having something that can almost always take out the biggest threat on the table as soon as it comes down. And often with Soren, you can take out the biggest threat on their side and still have a Soren. Stall and all, great win condition for us, comes down late game and takes over the game too. This is a really resilient piece, gaining us some life back, removing a big guy, or drawing us a card and hitting them for some damage, which is actually pretty good when you do it two, three turns in a row and you don't hit a land. That's important that you don't hit a land. But if you do, you still get to draw the card. However, we are playing a ton of cards in here that kind of cost a little more than average. So we have a pretty high likelihood of hitting them for four or five. Just overall, Soren is about as good as we hoped he was, and he probably will see a ton of play in the standard, but only in a couple of decks. I don't think he's going to go in the Allies deck or anything, the Black-White Allies, that people still love to this day. Um, and, you know, any of the lower stuff, you know, I don't think he's going to go in there, but these control decks, he's really good. And even though, you know, you can't play him at the end of the turn, he doesn't flash or anything like that, um, still a very good control finisher because he sits there and just does everything. Another Planeswalker, we're playing one copy of Obnixilis Illustrated Ignited. And another Planeswalker that just sits there and does everything. He's actually comparable to Soren in some ways, except he comes down a turn earlier. Just like Soren, his plus one draws you a card. It does a little damage to him, it draws you a card, essentially. Um, his, his second ability kills a guy, just like Soren's, you know. And you won't be ultimating Obnix too much, but just like Soren's ultimate, this can also win the game by itself. And it's really just a matter of time. After you ultimate Obnix, you're going to win the game if you keep things steady. So, you know, he's a way, another way of, of winning the game when conditions are important in control. But mostly, he just does everything you want a controlled Planeswalker to do. Every time the guy comes down on the board, in any deck I play him, I love to see him. You know, kills guys, draws your cards, that's everything you want in a deck like this. Let's switch into the creatures here. We're playing 12 creatures, which is kind of a lot for a control deck. You could really just call this Esper Threats. I feel like Esper just has some of the best cards in the format, whether they're control-oriented and kill guys or make them discard cards, counter spells, or really, really good creatures, too. We're about to see that, and amazing planeswalkers. So you got a really a, a pretty good host of threats in um, Esper right now. So let's look at some of those. We are playing eight two-drop creatures in this deck, four of which are Thing in the Ice, which I totally think is worth playing. I'm not sure if the control decks in the format are really going to end up playing this card, but I play tested it for Azorius Tempo, and I've been playing with this thing, and it's just been nothing but great for me. I mean, we have 18 things that can, um, you know, take counters off of it. That's awesome. We've got a Jutai's Command in the deck, so, you know, something other than Jace to bring back from the graveyard with a Jutai's Command. When you do transform it, it's freaking crazy. It's a huge guy. I mean, what else, what else do you want? from this early game amazing blocker against aggro and out of range of most you know red removal spells thing in the ice just really good early defensive card and flips over into something that they absolutely have to deal with or they lose the game so thing in the ice has been great for me especially considering again a jutai's command great another great reason to play that card four copies of jace in the deck i just want to 
say that we're, we have to play Jace. It's a competitive deck that has blue in it, so we have to play Jace. Sorry about that, but it allows us to recast all these bomb spells that we're playing, you know. allows us to have a little defense, draw cards, loot things, you know. We can always drop a thing in the ice in the graveyard with Jace, and then a Jutai's commanded into play later, if that's what we want to do, you know. So, Jace, lots of good tricks. You know, car drawing cards is good. Sometimes putting cards in the graveyard is good. He puts things in the graveyard he can then recast later. I mean, we've talked about Jace a million times. Um, his power level is high, and we can all see why. He really shouldn't be that much, but, you know, Jace, you have to play him. One copy of Kalatas in the deck, um, just, you know, another card that's really nice to play. <laughs> just again, this is Esper Threats. We're just playing some of the best cards in the entire format. This is sort of like the Abzan deck from last standard, you know? Play all the best cards. Why not do that? Kalatas is good with a lot of our removal, you know, and their creatures will die in combat and stuff like that. Um, getting us zombies that we can then, you know, swing through with going wide or make him bigger. And the lifelink is actually really important. That makes, you know, gives us a little bit more resiliency. If we play him on turn four against, you know, heavy creature decks, great to have a blocker that nets us, you know, three life when we block with it. That's really resilient, especially when they can get bigger and bigger as the game goes on. So I at least want the one copy of Kali. Two copies of Dragon Lord Ojutai, I think the best creature we could play other than Jace in the deck. I think this guy only gets better without Crackling Doom in the format. And there are still things to take care of him, you know, to the slaughters around, things like that. Um, but really, without Crackling Doom, I think the card just gets way, way better. And it's already a, a, an amazing beast. So, you know, as far as win conditions go, I definitely think that Ojutai is the best win condition we can play. And I say that even considering how good, you know, Grim Nemesis is, that's, that's quite good. But Ojutai will win the game for us more often than anything else. And I think in these colors, we absolutely have to play him. Another Dragon Lord in here. Here's Silumgar. Just the one copy of Silumgar in the deck. And I don't think that three dragons is worth playing, you know, a Foul Tongue Invocation or Silumgar Scorn. You could. You could try that out. I'm just I'm not too sure about three dragons being worth a four of Silumgar Scorn. But I do still want to play Silumgar. Being able to steal a guy when he comes in is just absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> so I, I like Silumgar. I don't know why he doesn't see a little bit more play. I mean, you see him pop up a good little bit, but... I see Esper control decks that don't play this guy, and I don't see why. I think he actually gets better, too, um, going past the rotation here. Let's look at our 18 spells we're playing here, starting with two copies of Duress. I do think it's still important to play Duress Collected Company decks. will probably be very important, and we still got all these commands in the format as well. There's a lot of other stuff you need to worry about. You know, Planeswalkers will probably see a lot more play, too. People are still playing enchantments like Silkrap, you know, and the people will probably play Oath of Nyssa and some other oaths. So I do think it's still important to play Duress, and it's good in the mirror so we can get counters and stuff out of their hand. We're also playing a few more creatures in the traditional control deck play, so it's nice to be able to pull removal and even mass removal out of their hand. Speaking of removal, we should probably play somewhere control deck. Let's start with three copies of Grasp of Darkness. I just think this is probably one of the best, if not the best, you know, two mana pieces of removal we can play. It's at instant speed. That makes a huge difference. It can take out things that happen to be indestructible, you know, so that's also important. This Grasp of Darkness is really probably the premier two mana removal spell in the format, so let's make as much room for those as we can. That said, I do want to at least play one copy of Declaration of Stone. This was flipped. I was playing one grass, three copies of Declaration. Turns out that them getting to draw the card is not the most ideal thing in the world. I'm sure, they have to pay two mana. But late in the game, if you Declaration something, then they'll be able to immediately pay the two and draw the card, which feels like you really didn't get much advantage out of that at all, if any. <laughs> so, but you do get to exile the creature, which is fairly important in this format, and it's much more splashable than grasp. So I want to not do a four of a grasp, Let's split it with a three of and a one of a declaration so we can not only exile things, but maybe, you know, have an easier time playing the card. Sucks that it's sorcery speed, but all things considered, I do like, you know, I think this thing has enough upside to at least play the one. More removal, but now we're in the three minute slot. Two copies of Ruinous Path in the deck. More Planeswalkers are probably going to see play, so that makes sense. Also can be a creature late game, which you really can underestimate in a deck like this, in any control deck. And <laughs> we're at absolute worst, kills the best creature on their side of the board. So, And I think Ruinous Path probably gets better too if the format slows down a little more, which it seems to have been trending to since um, Battle for Zendikar uh, came out. Really Oath of the Daywatch. You know, things, this format has probably slowed down at least a half turn, if not a full turn. It looks like we'll probably continue to do so. Um, with the loss of some really important aggro cards. So something like this, you know, a three mana key removal spell like this actually gets a little bit better. Speaking of three mana removal, we have a few slots for that. One copy of Anguish Done Making in the deck. And I think this is actually really important to play, but I don't want to play more than the one copy because we can't be doing all this damage. I also want to play Painful Truths 
in the deck, and that's just not going to be available to us, you know, playing all of these cards that suck our lives. So, one copy of Anguish Done Making is fine. It sort of takes the place of Utter End in a lot of, you know, control decks, which a lot of control decks were just playing the one copy of Utter End main deck anyway. So this just takes the place and costs less mana. So at instant speed, you know, it's just... Card is still fine, although I don't want to, you know, do all the damage to us to ourselves in a control deck. But life is just another resource, you know, sometimes definitely worth three life to exile a thing forever. Speaking of, I figured this would be a good place for Painful Truths right here. Three copies of that, and we need to play some kind of card advantage. We're playing three colors so we can get the full bang for our buck out of something like this. I do totally think it's worth playing. Drawing cards is something a control deck really wants to do, and drawing three all at one time is extraordinarily powerful. So, I don't want to play the full four of them. Some people have in Esper Control, but, you know, I feel like we, we've got a Planeswalker that draws, two Planeswalkers that draws cards, a creature that draws us cards. Still want though, to have a spell that does the same. So, drawing cards, again, super important for a control deck, and Painful Truce has proven to be a very powerful card, so let's make room for that. Two copies of Void Shatter in the deck, two of the five counter spells in the main deck, you know. Uh, control decks are really trending away from playing a bunch of counter spells to do their work for them, you know. We're focused more on board state and dropping a big threat late, which is control decks, you know. But in this control deck, we have to make room to not only play removal on turn two, like Grasp of Darkness or Declaration of Stone, we also have eight creatures in the two drop slot, so we can't play something like Clash of Wills as reliably, you know. So I want to start at three mana with the counter spells, and this is probably the best thing in the format to play. Three copies of a Jutai's Command in the deck. I think it's worth playing all three just because Thing in the Ice and and Jace are in the deck. And a Jutai's Command is great, especially considering, again, if the format gets a little slower, people play slightly bigger creatures, something like a Jutai's Command can be great. Countering a creature, gaining four, or drawing a card can be an amazing resiliency play. Not to mention, you know, gaining four or countering a guy and putting a thing in the ice um, back into play. Just amazing plays open to us with a Jutai's Command in the deck, and I, it might even be worth playing four, but I just don't know if I'd want to see him that often. And to finish off the main deck spells here, one copy of Secure the Wastes. Um, we are playing one copy of Westvale Abbey in the uh, lands here. I'll talk about that in a second, but Secure the Wastes really helps out with that. A lot of people have been talking about that already. But it's also just, A, a way of, you know, being removal. It's instant speed removal, because you can just, you know, when they swing in, play a big Secure the Wastes, gang tackle their biggest guy and kill it. You can also, at the end of their turn, just make a small army and then attack with it the next turn, you know, make like seven guys late game, which does happen, and then win. You know, it's kind of win condition in some ways. So, Secure the Waste, really, really um, versatile card. A lot of times you can gang tackle a dude on blocks at instant speed and leave a couple of guys behind. So, lots of good things you can do with Secure the Waste. And I could consider playing another copy. I just feel like the deck list is super duper tight at this point. But Secure the Waste is good every single time I draw it. 27 lands in the deck, and just so you know, these new lands work amazingly well with battle lands. I know a lot of people are talking about that already, but a lot of people haven't actually like played them, boxed it up, shuffled it up um, with a couple of different things now. And these decks work really, these lands work really, really well with one another. Turn one, you can often get the same thing as an old school dual land, basically, you know. Um, just an untapped thing that produces two colors um, on turn one, and it's better than a shock in a lot of situations. You know, we're playing eight of these battle lands in here, so it's very, very likely that you'll be able to un to play a hand land. I think that's what we're calling them right now. Um, you'll be able to play a hand land turn one untapped. So just cards, these lands have been very good. And also I want to point out Shambling Vent has been awesome. Again, very resilient card and helps out um, with some of the pain that we're taking from Anguish Sun Making and Painful Truths. So, and it's a threat, and it's a good blocker, so all four copies of Shambling Vent. And the one copy of Westvale Abbey doesn't come up too often, but we are playing just enough creatures in the deck, plus secure the ways to make this a thing, and if we can just hold on, then we can create the creature every single turn and eventually transform it. Doesn't usually happen that way, and I've only, you know, you don't transform this very often is all I'm going to say. Um, but really, really super amazingly good when you do, obviously, you know, just huge, undealable with do usually wins the game. But I like this as just a, um, you know, a chump block generator. That happens a lot. Um, I like this as just a thing that generates creatures once a turn, one way or the other, you know. So card is fine even when all it's doing is making one guy a turn. And it's, you know, it's, it's great when it flips, but it's not going to happen all the time. Let's move on to the sideboard here, and our sideboard is really, really important. Um, this usually isn't control, right? But really, your whole 75-card spread in a control deck is 
is just incredibly important. And some of these could see main deck play. We'll have to do some finagling. We'll see. But let's start with one extra copy of Duress. We're already playing two in the main. Let's supplement that with one copy in the board. Um, we're playing three copies of Silk Wrap against, you know, small aggro-based creatures decks, which we have to do a lot of work against in the sideboard here. Because we don't do great game one, because we, if you haven't noticed, we're not playing any main deck mass removal. That's because of all the creatures we are playing, so there, there's that to consider. Um, two Hallowed Moonlight against all the Collected Company decks that are in the format now, and will probably still be in the format come rotation. That Bank Company deck does not lose much. Um, we're playing one copy of Negate, not only against the uh, Collected Company decks also, but against the Mirror Match, you know, against other Mass Removal, against Removal, against um, all kinds of things, Commands, you know. So I really, really like Negate Planeswalkers, fantastic card. Um, we're playing two copies of To the Slaughter. Not super easy to get Delirium. You did notice maybe the one copy of Evolving Wilds. I might want to play more, actually, to get Delirium online a little bit easier. But To the Slaughter has been great whether Delirium's turned on or not out of the sideboard. And is especially good against opposing your Jutais. Um, two copies of Ob Infinite Obliteration, because we've got to be able to get the Ulamogs out of their hand. And I'm not sure that after losing Ugin, that deck will still be what it was. But Ulamog's too good of a card not to be in the format, so we've got to obliterate that. Um, and can also get rid of other stuff. People don't talk about that, but against gimmick decks like Collected Company, for instance, Infinite Obliteration is pretty good and can get that out of their hand before they have a chance to play it. Um, two copies of Languish in the board because we need mass removal. I mean, we, we absolutely do need that. Probably running low on time here, but I do want to take just a second and talk about a couple of cards I didn't play and why not. I've already mentioned I didn't play Silumgar's Scorn. Um, talked about that at length, but I'm sure people will still want to play it. You can play it if you want to. Um, I didn't play um, Silumgar's Command. That's another old card that I didn't play. Um, and I know a lot of times you wouldn't have to explain that you didn't play Silumgar's Command, but I do want to say that it may be time to reevaluate how we look at this card, considering the format may be getting slower, people are playing more Planeswalkers, so... Maybe it's time to take a second look at Silumgar's Command. I'm not sure. Some new cards that I wanted to play but didn't play are um, Welcome to the Fold, especially. I want to talk about that. With Jace in the deck, we can easily discard cards. That's, that's no problem at all. And I do think Welcome to the Fold could be good, but I haven't tried it yet. That's the thing is these next couple of cards are all new and I haven't tried them yet, but I do think they may have a place. Um, as far as Welcome to the Fold, I think this, this might be a particularly good card, but I'll have to test that. Um, the other cards I haven't played are Epiphany at the Drown Yard. I know people are probably going to get me in the comments for that. I haven't tried it yet. Definitely looks like it could be a thing, and I do like the instant speed. But I don't... I'm just not sold. Let me know. If you guys have play tested with Epiphany yet, I want to know what your results were, because I haven't tried the card yet. And the other thing I haven't tried, because it was just spoiled like two days ago at the time of this recording, was from under the floorboards. Um, people are talking about this as a control finisher. I don't see it, although some people are saying Black Sphinx's Revelation, because you get some creatures, you know, you gain some life. You know, it doesn't draw you the cards like Revelation, but it replaces it with creatures, which can sometimes be better, especially as a finisher in a control deck. Um, so, and again, with Jace, we can madness this fairly easily, so, you know, I'm thinking about trying it, I'm just not, for some reason this looks underpowered, like it's not going to actually work, you know what I mean? Um, but if anybody, again, has tested with that, let us know in the comments how it worked for you. Here's our power rankings right here. A final score of 69. That's pretty darn good. Very competitive deck. That's because we play some of the most powerful cards in the whole format. We're playing a lot of really good stuff you didn't know. You know, Jace, Thing in the Ice of Jutai, Soren, Obnixilis, a bunch of amazing spells, you know, good lands. <laughs> We're just playing a lot of amazing stuff in the deck. And sure, you know, our synergy's not high. We're a control deck. Our speed's not high. We're a control deck. We're playing a ton of powerful cards. Very resilient, you know, um, not only because of a Jutai's command, but also because we can gain a lot of life off of Soren, you know, we can just play these huge things late game that sort of outclass what they have. So very resilient deck. Um, and we've got a lot of defense, you know, a lot of removal in the deck, um, and especially post boards, a ton of removal. And I actually think we may get a shade better post boards, but I'm going to make game one and game two about the same here. The only bad news, as far as this goes, is that this deck reflects, you know, sort of Oath of the Gatewatch standard prices. Um, this deck is probably going to cost around $500 to $600 to make, and that's mostly because of Jace. But I do want to point out that it's nice not to have fetch lands. Notice that almost all of the lands in the deck cost anywhere between 4 and $5. So we're back to a standard where you can make a mana base for relatively cheap instead of like $250. It's only going to cost you, you know, $60 to $100 to make a very good mana base. It's going to last you for a really long time. 
in the format. So I, I actually love where we're moving towards as far as budget goes, and decks that don't play Jace are going to be way more budgeted, you know. So this is probably going to be one of the most expensive decks in the format, if only because it plays Jace, but still beats, you know, eight and nine hundred dollar price tags like we saw like six months ago. Or six weeks ago. That's pretty much all I got for now. Um, but this deck is super duper powerful if anybody wants to try it out. Like I said, I'm going to still do Esper um, Solar Flare. Don't worry. You know, I know a lot of people are pretty psyched for that. Um, but that deck is going to require a lot more um, sort of planning and finagling and figuring out. So give me some time on that. But in the meantime, we do have a bunch of other awesome deck decks coming up. we got Budget Wolves and Budget Humans on the way. Um, as, as budget as I can possibly make them, at least. Um, we'll have to see about Humans. I want to play Avacyn and Sigarda, so we'll see. We'll see. Um, and I want to play Jund and Grixis as well, which I've been working on Jund for a while and still need to really sink my teeth into Grixis. But I've got all four of those coming up, not to mention a bunch of other stuff. Look out for our top 15 upcoming decks video, as usual. Um, and we've got a lot of work to do, you know, set reviews and stuff like that. You gotta happen. Draft. I'm gonna do a couple of those um, on camera. So lots of stuff coming up for SOI. Make sure to sub if you're new or if you just haven't done that yet. It would, I would really appreciate it. And then hit the like button if you enjoyed the content. Or if you didn't, I just hit the like button. It takes two seconds. It really helps. I'm Dev from SBMTG. As always, thanks for watching, my wizards.